Hi, everybody, and welcome to Billboard's first ever Pride Roundtable. I'm Nolan Feeney, and I'm so lucky to be sitting here with Big Frida. Hi. Tegan Quinn of Tegan and Sarah. Hi. I love McConan. Hi. Haley Kiyoko. Hi. And Adam Lambert. I want to start by talking about everybody's Pride Month experiences. This year, it felt like you know Pride celebrations around the world were kind of bigger than ever. What felt different to you? What felt good? What felt not so good? What stood out to you about, uh, about Pride Month? Well, for me, Pride was very busy. I was very excited because uh, June was just like, cha-ching, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> so I was really excited just about the energy and all of the Prides that my team had booked for me. So I was going all over, just bringing great energy to people, um, freedom of expression, you know, uh, judge-free zone. And it was amazing just to go everywhere and, and have an amazing time. Uh, I guess I'll say, we're all like, I don't know. If Haley, it's your order. turn. We're it's my so turn. <laughs> um, I had a great, it was my first time like being in the parade. I was in the oh. World Pride Parade in New York and was on the float and waving and dancing. And I, I was telling my friends, like, I, I felt very grateful to be there because so many kids and adults maybe we'll never experience that or haven't experienced being in a parade. And the feeling of, like, pride was just so different. Because I've always just, like, celebrated, like, oh, like, I'm gay, like, yay, like, I love myself, and then I'm like, good to do. <laughs> but I never, like, celebrated it. And it is worth it because I just, I was so proud of who I was. And um, it's, it's something you kind of, can't explain because it's just this feeling where you feel connected to everyone in the city and the world and um, it ignites hope in you. So yeah. it was a really cool experience for me. I was in New York as well. Um, the week leading up to the parade, I had to leave for the weekend because I had like two days off before rehearsing for the next thing. But being in the city that week felt amazing. The energy was palpable. Mm -hmm. Um, there were a lot of interesting conversations going on, you know, this whole debate about is it enough that they're slapping rainbow flags on, you know, commercial businesses. There was a lot of discussion going on, which I thought was really productive. Yeah, I felt like this was the year everyone was talking about, like, corporate pride and everything yeah. and, and doing a lot of, you know, talking about the state of the world and everything. And, um, Frida, I love that you were saying that, like, pride is like work. And that's well, I mean, a, but a lot of times for me also, you know, I— I've been doing this, and a lot of the places been having corporate prides. They're in front of the mayor's office in, in a lot of places or right in front of City Hall. So uh, a lot of times these places are involved in the prides that they throw, but it's about the people that come out to support the prides. And I was very happy the whole Pride Month. I've experienced also being in a, on a float yeah. in New York, not this year, but a year before. And it's just an amazing feeling, all of the energy and the love coming down the streets, people hollering and screaming. <laughs> and like, and we also had music and a DJ on our float, so it was a lot of shaking <laughs> and a lot of stuff going on. And um, Was there tequila, though? Oh, most definitely. <laughs> <laughs> most definitely. So it was just an amazing feeling. Like, And I'm very proud to show my pride all the time. Time. And I don't just need June for it. I do that year round. Mm. I'm curious, you know, you all represent and, and show up for the LGBT community in so many different ways. But as artists, you never want your sexuality to kind of define your work. You know, you want your work to speak for itself. I'm curious how you all think about being out and visible without letting the industry, you know, put a label on you or, or put your career in a box. I mean, I know for, for me, it, it's been a double whammy throughout our career because the, I've got put into the, like, the lesbian box or the queer box, but also being a twin. And there's something very inherently uncomfortable about always being talk, always talking about your sexuality with your twin there. <laughs> uh, like, it's just like, so especially when we were really young and we first came out and we started playing music, it was really strange to be sitting predominantly with men, straight men, and talking about, so you're, so you're 18 and you're gay, do you guys wanna talk about that? And it was just always like, <laughs> not really? <laughs> and not because I wasn't proud, but because it was just awkward to be talking to people who were like, you know, decades older. And so I never felt like uncomfortable being seen as an LGBTQ artist. I just didn't ever want it to like overshadow the, the music, you know. And, and that's a fine line, like how to not seem like you're mm -hmm. trying to like shy away from who you are, but not letting it, you know, music is supposed to be universal, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't want to put myself in too tight of a box because I don't want to miss out on all these other people who I think will really, really resonate with what we're doing. So, I think it's changed so much in the last decade, too, because it, 10 years ago, 
when I started my professional journey, it was like in the mainstream media, there weren't a lot of people representing. And so mm -hmm. it was like that was the thing that all the media wanted to talk about, and that was sort of the headline. Mm -hmm. And I remember having a similar sort of struggle with it, because on one hand, I was like, well, I'm really gay and I'm into it. I mean, I have <laughs> no issues with it. Um, have been for a while. And I loved talking about it, and I was really open, but at the same time, I was always like, wait, can it not precede me? Can it be a part of the conversation, not like the forefront? Mm -hmm. And I think too, like, for me, in like what you were saying, um, you had to come out, and you you still have to come out a lot of the time, or you feel pressure to come out, and it's so hard, like, to come out to yourself. And so, like for me, I was like, I don't want to have to go through this process again. Like, I know who I am, and I've dealt with the judgment that I've put on myself, and. I don't want to have to go through this process again of coming out to the world because I already know who I am. And so I tried the best as I could to utilize my art to kind of tell people who I was through my art because I that was a fear that I had. I didn't want to have to go through that again because it is difficult to love yourself and figure out who you are and then to have to do it again and to explain yourself to people. Um, it can be, you know, challenging. Definitely. That brings me to my journey because, you know, on my first 10 years of my journey, it was just like I was starting off and I was figuring out still who I was as, a, you know, coming from being a kid and just being in music in New Orleans. And then I had to redo it all over again when I became bigger into the world. Mm. So instead of being able to have to say, oh, well, I'm gay and this is me, I started tell, telling the story through my music mm -hmm. and through my art. And and that's the way that we kind of want to express ourselves without having to say, oh, I'm gay, and just do what we do and mm -hmm. go out there and make great music and great stuff. And um, so it, that, it, you do have that journey where you want to pull back sometime. Um, but it's still hard for me. I can't pull back. I'm 6'3", mm -hmm. I'm tall, and I, I'm <laughs> gay. So it's, you see me <laughs> when I walk in the room, I light up the room. And it's just about... Um, just keep on making moves and mm -hmm. keep on pushing and, and breaking barriers for me. And that's what it's about. Yeah, same for me. Because in uh, hip hop, I know it wasn't very supported to come out as gay and it's not really many out artists in hip hop. And so I knew that this was gonna be a big thing for me. I'm from Atlanta, you know what I'm saying? Georgia, and it's like the black gay capital of the world. And it's like, you know, I've experienced a lot of things and I was just like, I don't know why everybody is so afraid to take the stand in this when everybody in Atlanta knows what's going on, but we mm -hmm. are on to the main stage of the main world and try to act like it's just not a thing and it's like it don't exist, but, mm -hmm. and it's almost get bashed, and you know what I'm saying? But it's like a lot of these artists or a lot of art, a lot of people in the industry get their, um, get their creative and their their inspiration from the gays and stuff, but it's like people don't want to give it up to the gays, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And so I just felt like with me and hip hop, I wanted to be able to come out for the future and people of now. You know, a lot I know like a lot of people from the past, it was going to rub them the wrong way or make it an issue and stuff, but I was like, it's really not for them. It's for me and it's for people that are living in the time now, and this yeah. is what people are dealing with. And it's like somebody needs to be talking about these issues and showing that you could uh, be yourself in any field and not really feel, um, you know, feel scared when it's not as promoted or as supported. So mm -hmm. I just felt like it was a big step for me to do that. And um, I've seen it inspire others. So it's made me very happy. And like mm -hmm. having the support and having seen, like you guys, you guys are legends to me and have been, you know, out and doing it way before. And so it's just like, I feel very happy to be a part of this company. Oh, yeah. oh that's so sweet. <laughs> I love that. I, I was thinking about how, you know, Old Town Road by Lil Nas X is now the... I was just saying. I it, that love was just, him. I was just thinking that in my I head. I love it. As it's we huge. Were it's, it's the uh, longest running number one single by a queer artist in Billboard Hot 100 history. It's and wow. I was thinking about that and how when he came out, it was very sort of nonchalant. And, and I think the reaction to that was, was very positive. But I think the reaction was also kind of equally chill. And... I'm curious, you know, watching that, what you all think and what you take away from that of what this means about whether this stuff kind of thing is important to listeners or, you know, if you look at that and think that hip-hop is changing, like, what has, has that sort of, uh, 
what have you taken away from from watching the success of, of him in that song? The world is changing. I mean, definitely, it, especially in, in the United States in particular. We're just moving on. We're moving forward, and that is a direct evidence of that. But also, it helps he had a number one song. <laughs> I feel like it, it gave him the confidence yeah. to be like. I can do whatever the heck I want, mm-hmm. you know? I'm the guy with the number one single, you know, which is amazing. Well, th- and these moments are incredibly important and they do trickle down, but you know, like not to be the womp womp person on the, <laughs> <laughs> in the conversation, but it's like, you know, as we all know, because we interact with our audience all the time, and it's the people we are, we hear their stories. Like, you know, when you are in the, the positions of privilege that we are still like getting to play music and be entertainers. We hear these stories all the time where it's not necessarily making it better for the average person who's living in a rural community or doesn't have access to, you know, positive LGBTQ representation within their own community. And it still is so meaningful that we're all putting our story out there and that, you know, this is a massive triumph and a massive win. But I think sometimes that leads the media to believe that that means that everything's, everything's okay. fine. Yeah. And it's like, not that I mean that we need to now highlight the bad stories, but I think that they're just, there has to be more done on a, you know, a foundational level to change the system, you know, that I still think that there's still a, a long way to go. And mm-hmm. so these wins are great, but I'm mm-hmm. always like, but it doesn't mean it changed everything. It doesn't change no, everything I, overnight. I agree, because like, I'll do interviews and they'll just be like, so, like, what's it like where everyone just loves everyone and everyone's... Yeah, totally. We love the gays and rainbows (laughs) everywhere. And it's like, it's great, but, you know, we're interacting with kids all over the world. They're not having that same experience. And it's, you still have to share who you are and inspire and be yourself and push the boundaries and help people grow and love. You know, Mm -hmm. we we just have to keep working because it's not just all all glitz and glam. It's going to keep taking all of us as a community to keep educating the folks. Absolutely. Educating the kids, educating everyone on you know, on how it goes. And that's how it happened for us because, you know, all of a lot of elderly queens who I grew up with, they kind of taught us the ropes, all the queens Mm -hmm. in New Orleans. So it's just going to be about keep on educating and making people aware and telling these stories. And the history, too. I feel like like a lot of people that I meet in this next generation coming up aren't necessarily all aware of everything that's come before them. To agree with you, I think it's like, let's talk about the fundamental building blocks of the civil, like the, the gay civil rights movement. They don't you know? know nothing about it. It's, a lot of yeah. times I had posted something on my page about um, Pride Month, and it was just like, um, oh, we're going to start this straight pride or whatever. Um, <laughs> it was this big old thing where it was a straight pride that was starting yeah. in another place. And, it, and then I, I was like, do y'all really understand the meaning of pride? No. The people that fought for this mm-hmm. month and mm-hmm. what they had to go through and the meaning behind why we celebrate pride. We celebrate life every day, but this is for people who fought for a certain reason. Stonewall was not just for, you know, to be Stonewall mm-hmm. or a wall that was made of stone. <laughs> it was a reason that we, those people fought for our rights mm-hmm. and for their rights and for all the stuff that was going on back in, in, in that time. So just educating is very important and, and all of us t- sharing our stories. You all got into this business to be entertainers, but I think when you're a queer artist, there's an assumption sometimes that you will also be a queer activist. How did you decide whether or not to take on that role and and how much of an activist to be in in your careers and how to use your platform? Well, for me, I definitely want to use my platform in every way that I can. Uh, All I can do is what I can and, and use the resources that I can. When the time is right, to get out there and and speak for the people that I don't need to speak for and the people that don't have a voice and I can speak for them, I go and do just that. Um, when it's the right politics I'm, and something I believe in, I'm going and I'm going to fight for it and, and give my opinion. Um, it's very important to me. I was really overwhelmed in the very beginning um, because the American Idol thing was so fast and that was at a point where the show was being watched by like 30 million people a week and it was like, Literally in the course of two months, all of a sudden, I was like on magazine covers. And on a personal level, I was dealing with like the personal adjustment that I had to make, which was very confusing. And then on top of it, there was all this um, energy behind being the gay guy that's doing it. And Mm -hmm. it took me a second to sort of navigate like where I stood on all that and how I wanted to represent the community. I knew that, uh, I knew without a doubt that I was comfortable 
saying, yes, I'm gay. I was comfortable talking about it. But the education thing, like you were saying, educating the masses, what I found really interesting was that I was educating a lot of like middle Americans who watched American Idol. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's a big job. And there weren't a lot of other people doing it. And I, I wasn't an expert. I didn't get into this business to be the educator. You just I, gotta be you. Yeah, I just and wanted to wear glitter and sing, you yeah. know? You just gotta be you. Yeah. Same thing with me when I was doing my TV show. I'm dealing with all of this demographic from young to maybe 60. And all of these people are learning about me and what I do when, you yeah. know, a gay artist. So mm -hmm. I was educating the masses as well. Yeah. And it's just like, all you can do is go out there and be you and be the best you and let the story tell itself. Because a lot of times I can't, I don't have time to sit back and write the story. I got to keep on moving because I'm steady working and trying yeah. to make moves and, and steady break barriers and knock down doors for other people and give other people opportunities. I get a lot of DMs all the time. Oh, you know, kids who don't know how to come out to their parents. Yeah. Parents who don't know how to deal with their kids who are gay. All kinds of stuff. And it's just like, I try to give the best advice I can give and that's all I can do. Yeah. You know? The leading by example is most, a form of most activism. Definitely. Yeah. Role model. Yeah. Just be the best that you can be and give the best advice that you will want somebody to give you in that same yeah. position. Yeah. I felt a lot of pressure. Yeah. I didn't feel like there was very much of our career that we weren't kind of pushed to be more political, speak out. I think it, as, a, as, as queer women, especially back in the late 90s, early 2000s when Sarah and I started, there were just not a lot of women in our age group that were out. And um, we used to joke that like only one queer female group or lesbian group was allowed to be popular at a time. And so when it was like the baton was handed to us, it was like, and now, like, you now know, it, it was like us. the Indigo now Girls no handed time. it to Tegan and Sarah. And it was like, you must go forth now and be <laughs> our lesbian ambassadors. And, yeah. and we were shit disturbers because I was like, I'm not a lesbian, I'm queer or I'm gay. I want the cool names. I don't want to be a lesbian. It sounds like it sounds like labia. To be honest, that's what it sounds like. And I was like, that was also hard to talk to. <laughs> that was also hard to talk to older men about. Like when they're like, so you're both labia. That's what I heard. And I was like, I want to be political and I want to make people uncomfortable. I wanted to teach people the language. Mm -hmm. I agree. I was like, if we're going to be forced into this awkward conversation about <laughs> sexual identity, then let's talk about it. But we didn't have the language. I mean, I really resonate with you. Like you're forced into the situation and language is moving really quickly and Definitely. we're becoming much more, I and mean, we've grown up as a culture so fast. We have. And our community is doing an excellent job of educating everyone, but we don't necessarily just, you're not just like born with the like knowledge of like and how to now, say it and blah, do blah, it. Blah. Yeah, no, like no. So my, my hard drive doesn't automatically get updated with all the like new everything. And it's like, I'm old now. So I'm, sometimes I'm like, I don't know, but, no but I felt the pressure to stay up with it, to keep connecting, because again, to bring it back to it, it's about our, it's about the young people and the people that we get to interact with. And I hope, even when I felt the pressure or I sometimes felt like deeply, deeply, deeply irritated and resentful that I had to carry the baton sometimes, and I admit that, there would be these incredible moments where a, a parents would have packed all their kids into a car and driven nine hours so they could meet us because their youngest had come out and their youngest mm -hmm. had used us as an example of like, it's gonna be okay, look at Tegan and Sarah, like they're, well-adjusted-ish and, you know, normal-ish, and they've been successful, and their mom accepts them. And mm -hmm. you think to yourself, oh, yeah, that's why we're doing this. Like, this is why we're doing it. We made it a little bit easier for this kid. And and so I felt the pressure, but I was happy to, to mostly, you know. To I it. was one of those, not to, like, put into age, but, I mean, Get in it. Tegan and Sarah, like, I, that, I would listen to Tegan and Sarah, like, in my car on a road trip, and I'd be like... If they can do it, I can do it. <laughs> you know, like, they have short hair, I have short hair. Like, <laughs> I look just like them. <laughs> like, and so, but, but... Representation. But I think, too, when I when you're circling around, like, being, like, an activist and stuff, like, it, there's so much going on in this world. So many people need help. There are a lot of issues. So for me, my focus is so I don't get like depressed and like, and like feel like trapped because you just sometimes you get overwhelmed. You're like, I want to help you this. Do. I want this. I want that. I want that. I'm not doing enough. I'm not saying enough. Um, I really just try to focus on keeping people alive and moving forward because I think that if you can continue to inspire hope and like give that light when people are in that darkness, mm -hmm. if they are here on this earth, mm -hmm. they will be able to help you 
continue to make this world a better place. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I try to focus on as best as I can and just trying to be there and being as real and honest about just life as possible because the more people that stick around and love themselves and not hurt themselves, the more that they can help, you know? And so that's, that's what I try to focus on. Put that good energy out there in the world. Yeah. It's, it's funny that you talk about uh, feeling overwhelmed because I was going to say, Haley, your fans call you Lesbian Jesus, uh, which is a wonderful <laughs> yeah. nickname. But it is a it, wonderful <laughs> nickname. But it's, I also it's, wonder sometimes if that ever feels like a lot uh, to sort of carry and that, you know, you like that's a huge title to be bestowed upon you. Yeah, I don't know who. <laughs> why, why'd they do that? <laughs> um, uh, I, I always talk about, though, I, I, I don't feel pressure from like my supporters and fans because they're like the only people that I feel like have really helped me love myself. And so they're not really putting pressure on me. The only pressure I feel is from myself, like wanting to be healthy, taking care of myself, putting out the best music I can, like just being the best version of myself that I can be. And so that pressure I give to myself mm -hmm. and it's, it's gnarly pressure. <laughs> um, but I'm grateful that uh, my fans are able to, I don't know, make me, they really made me love myself very, a, a lot quicker than probably I would have in the industry because I was terrified of releasing music and having the word gay next to my name was just like my worst nightmare. <laughs> and now people call me lesbian <laughs> Jesus. And it's not a nightmare, it's a dream. <laughs> Things have really turned. <laughs> <laughs> Ravonin, do you experience that at all, of, of this sort of realization of like, oh, wow, I, I mean something to some of my fans more than just they like my music, but I'm, I'm a symbol to them? Yeah. I, I don't really feel a pressure, but more like a responsibility. Mm. You know, it's like these people, they look up to me and they, they support me. And so when they ask for advice or, you know, anything, I just feel, you know, like responsibility. The least I can do is just respond in a Snapchat message or Instagram and, you know, give my advice and, you know, you know, just like try to be there as much as I can be there, you know, but um, it's not really a pressure because I, I don't really feel like I have to go around and I don't know, tell everybody like you need to do this, you need to do that. But I just feel like the ones that want to learn or want to want the help, I'm there to help them and give them stuff because I felt like sometimes I would be uh, pushing my views on others rather than telling like, you know, you're supposed to be like this and they're supposed to act like this. And like, you know, but I was just like, that's. I'm I'm so, I'm sounding very um, you know demanding or, or on people, so I'm just like you know if you come and ask me my thoughts on it or whatever you're going through, I can give you my opinion, and you know mm -hmm. that's just how I feel. But I feel like we owe those people responsibility. You know they'll come out, they'll buy your merch, they'll sing all your songs, support you. The least you can do is give them you know like five minutes of conversation, and because that it really means something to them because they mm -hmm. really listen to you. You know rather than just telling others that aren't going to really hear it. We were talking about language earlier, and I was thinking about sort of the words we use to talk about queerness and queer culture have changed so much. And I was thinking about so many of the younger artists coming up today embrace fluidity and don't feel like they have to put a label about their sexuality or their gender and their identity. And I wonder if you all see that shift happening and if that speaks to you and informs kind of how you think about yourselves. It's kind of a full circle thing because in the 70s, that was all over the place. I mean, it kind of comes back around. In the 80s, there was a moment, you know, where androgyny and sort of, mm -hmm. it was cool to be sort of, you know, in the middle. I mean, you look at people like Boy George in the early 80s. You go back in the 70s, you look at Bowie, you look at Freddie Mercury in that early, early time. I mean, all of that's happened before. So it's interesting when you look at what's happening right now is that it, it cycles. Circles back it cycles, around. yeah. I think, you know, I think, you know, into the, the late 80s, into the 90s, people were scared. Uh, we had the AIDS crisis. We had a lot of con like conservative forces in our country that freaked everybody out and, and cracked down on things. And then in the 90s, it started to kind of explode again. Mm -hmm. And then it went, it, it, it just does this, it breathes. Yeah. So I'm, I'm excited, actually, for where we're at. I think it's creating yeah. a lot of freedom for people. It has. Uh, and, and the expression is flowing, and people are, 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 are being who they want to be. I it's love it. It's kind of made it feel a little more like a community, too, because yeah. I know for me, for a lot of my career, I felt like very separate from like the other letters yeah. in yeah. the community. You know what I mean? Yeah, like Sometimes definitely. it just felt like it was. It, there just didn't seem to be a lot of conversation between 
all of us, and it's felt really nice to, like I know when Sarah and I started identifying as queer, we took a lot of heat from from the lesbian community because they felt like we were rejecting that word. But mm -hmm. for me, it embodied not just my sexuality, but my gender, which was that like I don't feel like super, super, super feminine. It doesn't mean that I don't identify with my female side, but to me, queer was a less female sounding word. And so I wanted it to be mine and we took a lot of heat. And now it's so cool to like see all these new people coming up and talking about, you know, like smashing the binary and like, do, like I just, and, and the future is fluid and I'm just like, I'm all for it. You know, yeah. just whatever brings our community together because I think we're stronger when we're working together and we're communicating with each other and we're not so siloed, you know? What I like is that it's not, um, when I first started, it was like, you know, I had, I was wearing a lot of makeup, like a lot, more what? than I am today, like spackle. <laughs> and the thing that was interesting was in, in communicating and uh, being um, an artist with a lot of mainstream middle American fans, I think that they associated my visual appearance with my sexuality like this. Mm -hmm. And... I always found that very interesting, and it was a bit hard to sort of explain to people. I'm like, well, they're not really one and the same thing. I mean, I know a lot of gay guys here in, in L.A. that would be terrified of wearing a stitch of makeup. Mm -hmm. that, that would be like the furthest thing that they'd want to look like. And I was, you know, kind of dressing more like a rock and roll guy. I wanted to look like my heroes, you know, my, um, you know, people like... Uh, Mick Jagger and Bowie, and, and many of which identify as straight or later identified as straight. And explaining that to, mm. you know, Susie Homemaker in, in Ohio, that was interesting. So they didn't quite understand that the makeup didn't mean gay. It was just fashion. Mm. Uh, and I think now, I think we're in a place where people don't jump to those conclusions as quickly. Um, expression is expression and fashion is fashion. Yeah. But Conan, I was curious about what you think about this because before you came out and if it came up in interviews, I remember reading answers where you would talk about, you know, people want to call me this, if people want to call me that. Um, and I remember thinking that that was sort of like a really radical idea. And, and was that sort of easy for you to kind of just sort of embrace the, you know, we don't need a particular label for it? Yeah, because it's like I'm still living and learning, you know what I mean? And it's like if I had an experience with a girl last night and I said I'm gay, then it's like, what am I, you know? So I was like, I can't really put a, put a, a um, what do you say, a label on it, you know? But it was like, I have friends that are, you know, they're, they're everybody's experienced stuff. And so it's like, I, I don't like to, I didn't want people to start labeling them because it's then like, oh, my friend's gay. Well, then it's like, oh, he can't come over, you know? And then it's like, or this, she's a lesbian. They're like, oh, well, we don't want to hang out with them. And it's like, None of that really matters. You know what I'm saying? It's like, we're just coming to hang out. I mean, if you're trying to have mm -hmm. sex with them, that's your thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, we're just coming to hang out and have a good time, and that's how it should be. But that's what I, you know, found. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. The fact that, like, your sexuality doesn't necessarily in indicate your entire identity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's an important step that we're taking you know, as a society. For mm -hmm. me, you know, they always ask me, what's your you know, preferred pronoun, and I'm like, it don't matter. You can call me he, you can call me she. I know who I am, and I'm comfortable with who I am, and I'll answer you to either or mm -hmm. without being rejected, you know? And sometimes I want to be free, or sometimes I might want to be Freddie. This depends on how I feel that day. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I never let a, no one put a label on me or, you know, um, any of that. I just just live. Yeah. I think it's interesting because, like, I, like, f with my experience, I, I didn't want a label at all, which most of us don't ever want to be labeled. But I, breaking into the music industry and, like, dealing with what I was dealing with and trying to navigate where I belonged and how I belonged. And then once I released my music and there was, like, this outpour of support for the fact that, I did like girls. Um, I had learned that by embracing my label as like being a lesbian, being gay, I was helping normalize that for so many other people because I grew up being scared of being gay because of what gay girls looked like or what lesbians looked like or, you know, what people thought of le Labia. like, oh, lesbian, scary, <laughs> ah, you know? And I was like, oh my gosh, is that me? And I was like, but that's not me. I like girls, but I'm not a scary person. And so I, it was this weird experience where I was like, oh, if I just own who I am, 
then people then I'll be able to change people's like I don't know perspective on what gay is and what it looks like and that there's a huge spectrum of what that is and where you land and so it's interesting so, but maybe these labels become where the labels get uncomfortable is when they're used against us, right? So like, well, there's a negative. It's yeah. a negative. Because like, I love being. I'm fine to be like queer or lesbian yeah. or gay, but like when it's used as a, a way to, you know, marginalize judge me, you. then it's different. Yeah. Yeah. Judge you, or when it when it comes with yeah. weight, and it depends on whose mouth it's coming out of. Of course, and the way they express it. And yeah, the way, definitely. Because <laughs> mm-hmm. a lot of times people are like, oh, you're gay, yeah. Oh, and it, but it's the way that they say mm-hmm. it. You know, it wasn't it, no harm intended. Yeah. You know, so mm-hmm. it just depends on the person and yeah. yeah. Like I feel like so much of my career at the beginning, what I was rejecting was there was it wasn't just the gay label, but it was like, like it just was so uncool sounding. <laughs> that was my thing. It was like Canadian folk duo, lesbian, <laughs> twin sisters, Tegan and Sarah. And I'm like, if I saw our photo in that headline underneath, like double trouble, gay twins from Canada, like I would just be like, like you know, switch the page. It sounds so uncool. And co- gay has gotten way cooler. Like some of these like, you know, words have gotten way cooler. Mm-hmm. But there was, for me, it felt like a way of saying, it felt like coded language that said, hey, straight people, this isn't for you. <laughs> you know, hey, men, this isn't for you. Yeah, and for me, like, when I was growing up, um, what would really make me mad and want to hurt somebody when they would just call me a fag, you know, they would just be drilling that in my Mm -hmm. head at school or, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. in high school or or when a guy, you know, you're fat sissy or you're faggot, Mm -hmm. you know, this or that. So that, when they use it in that term, it will really piss me off, and that's when I would really want to take somebody off their feet. So I I try, you know... To stay away from those people in that negative space, yeah, because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. that that can really take you out out, out of character, and um, I'm not trying to go there. Yeah, it's probably for the best. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> it's funny because when I when I started, I you know, I moved to LA when I was about 18, 19, and I was doing theater and a, and you know made friends here in town that were like me, and I had my circle, and I didn't really experience hardly any real homophobia or any real, there, I, I was a very comfortable situation. I had great friends. I was having a great life. Uh, when I was a kid, I'm, I'm a bit sheltered, I guess. I, I grew up with parents that were really supportive. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm lucky, okay? Now, when everything started at 27 with American Idol and all of a sudden, it's like, now you're a celebrity. Now you're like fodder for everybody. And you go into those comment sections, which we know can be real toxic mm-hmm. on the internet. Oh, yeah. Not that mine. Was the mine first are perfect. Time. Perfect. Really? <laughs> you have haters? Oh, what? No. Weird. no. That's too, I'm sorry for, for Just the rest again. of you. So sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but dealing with that for the first time at 27. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it must have been like a It shock. was weird. And all of a sudden, I actually finally had more empathy for the rest of my community. You know, a lot of my friends would had really rough upbringings or grew up in parts of the country where they were bullied heavily. All of a sudden, I understood it. But I was kind of late to the game in, in, in understanding what that felt like. Mm-hmm. Some of you have been out from the beginning of your career. Some of you came out later. And I was hoping you could walk me through what some of those uh, decisions is, are like and what the process is like. What weighs on you? What are you thinking about? What are the voices that are supportive? What are the voices that are less supportive? Kind of walk me through uh, what the process was like. Mokona, can we start with you? Yeah. Um, I came out January 20th, 2017. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was the day Donald Trump got inaugurated. Oh. And so I know, like... Wow. Obama um, was very supportive of the gays, and I guess Trump wasn't. So I was like, "Oh, I want to come out right now, mm-hmm. and make it a, a, you know, make it a thing to where it's like, you know, I'm not doing this for to get everybody's support. You know what I mean? I'm doing this for me, and I want others to be able to have that same thing." I said, "You know, right now the climate, it would not be, I guess, as supported to come out with Donald Trump going as in president. It's like you should have came out with Obama, and then you know maybe you'd have been, you know." And I was like. No, I want to do this for me, and uh, really, who really inspired me is my friend Marcus, and uh, he was older. He passed away in 2017 as well, but um, he was an older gay guy in Atlanta, and he was black, and he's always been out ever since I've known him, and he was just always so, like, strong and just fearless, Mm -hmm. and, like, he was my muse, and so, like... um, we would always hang out and I would talk to him about it and I was telling him like, you know, I'm thinking about coming out and stuff and he was telling me like, you know, 
you shouldn't do it yet. And then we stopped talking for about a year. And then um, I came out in January, he ended up passing in April. But like he was a very um, like strong point for me to go ahead and do this for myself because he's always supported me and always been down with me. And it was like, he was really like, you know, whenever you're ready, I'm here to support you to let you, you know what I'm saying? Get your wings and fly type of thing. And so mm -hmm. that's what really um, made me come out of my career. And also was a lot of my fans. And I'm seeing like a lot of fans dealing with, you know, their sexuality and their emotions. And so I was just like, you know, I just want to, I want to be honest and be real with the people that support me. And I, I felt like they will be able to see a mirror in me as, as with them. And I know, like, like you said, like in middle America, it's all in places where my music goes, where it's not like supported to come out as gay, where it's not your family will turn your back on you and stuff. And so, um, you know, I just wanted to be a, like a, uh, an example mm -hmm. because I felt like a lot of people in hip hop and in rap have the opportunity to sort of do this. And like nobody has wanted to do it or step up to do it, but it's like it's been a big thing in the community for a long time, like the down low, gay, and mm -hmm. all this stuff. And so, I just wanted to be the change I wanted to see in the world. So, yeah. I love that. Adam, could you talk about your experience because you had a very orchestrated kind of coming out uh, through <laughs> a magazine cover story? Well, it was so weird because I I was out already, but all of a sudden really quickly I was a celebrity, and that wasn't part of the conversation because I wasn't doing interviews. When you go on American Idol, at least back then at that point, once you entered like the top 12 or whatever, they weren't letting you interact with the press. And this was before Twitter. Um, <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Um, I'm old. <laughs> and, and it was so weird because I hadn't really wrapped my head around it. I was, I was out at 18. I was really obviously out. I would talk about boys all the time. Even on set with people, I'd be like, oh, he's cute, you know, whatever. It just didn't seem to ever come up in conversation. No one asked me a question about it. There was no mm -hmm. prompt. There was no uh, reason that I saw in that moment because all I was being asked about was, why did you choose this song this week? And who's your favorite singer? And, you know, basic stuff, um, not personal stuff. And I think in hindsight, I look back on it now, and been, uh, you know, maybe it would have been kind of cool to, to make a stand and, and proclaim it, but it just didn't come up. So after the show ended, all of a sudden they were, um, you know, there was all this talk and, and, and I did a press conference and that's when we decided, okay, why don't we do this with a responsible journalist who won't steer it the wrong way, who will ask the right questions. And that journalist worked for Rolling Stone. So I did it on the cover. And what a cool way to get a cover on Rolling Stone. Totally. I wish I could re-come out. <laughs> yeah, right? I was like, let's do this <laughs> kind of this way. Yeah. <laughs> well, Tegan, I'm curious too, because, you know, I think for the entire band's history, you were out, and I wondered if you ever had a decision from the beginning to do that, or whether there was a talk of, you know, do we stay in the closet and not talk about that from the beginning? of? Because I think, Adam, you bring up a good point. There's sort of the personal coming out, and then there's sometimes the career coming out. Mm -hmm. It's weird because uh, Sarah and I didn't ever come out to each other and we didn't ever talk about being gay. And so Sarah was having relationships for two and a half years before, but I knew she was, but we never talked about it. It's like this weird misconception that, you know, twins must tell each other everything, we're sisters, we must talk mm -hmm. about everything, but we really didn't. And um, so our coming out, even our personal coming out was kind of strange and disconnected. And so, and our career coincided with it because we signed a deal right out of high school. So, um, it was weird. We just didn't talk about it, but we looked really gay. Like, we had, like, you know, spiky hair. Like, you know, it was very, like, 90s. Like, you know, so it was the spike, this. It was like this. Like this, like, you know. <laughs> I'd, I'd this. raise my arms higher, but I can't because I'm, like, pinned to the suit. But, <laughs> but um, so I think, I think people knew, and if they didn't know, they were not sure. And then the few people that were were completely not realizing that we were gay were, like, do you guys have boyfriends? And, and I would just be like, no. And I never felt like a lie or anything. But um, Elliot Roberts, who signed us, he managed Neil Young. And um, he had a conversation with us one afternoon. And Sarah just burst out, like, we're gay. Is it okay to talk about it? You know, we were 19. You know, we just signed a record deal. And he just kind of chuckled. And he said, are you gay? And we are like, yeah. He was like, you should say you're gay. And we were like... I think I just like melted into the chair. I was so embarrassed. <laughs> like, because talking about sexuality was like talking about sex. I don't know if anyone else here feels that, but like sometimes <laughs> I had to get over that. Like, 
it feels like you're talking about sex. So it felt, I was like 19 and was like, wow, this is so uncomfortable. So yeah, it was just part of our narrative. But there was no talking about it really because everyone was so awkward about it. So we had years to establish a language, but it was just part of it. But we did look really gay. Lots of puffy vests, <laughs> sandals on stage. <laughs> <laughs> well, for me, what's understood don't need to be explained. And I, to go back to what you were saying, I came out at a very early age, like 12, to my mom. And um, I sat my mom down at my birthday party, at my 12th birthday party, and told her in front of my friends. But my mom already knew, and that's what she told me. She said, baby, mama already knows. So, um, <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, she said, mama already know, and I'm going to love you wow. regardless. And that's amazing. once I got my mom's support, there was nothing else in the world that I needed for a support. Right. And from that day forward, she was just like my biggest supporter. She just wanted me to have morals and values, and she wanted me to respect myself so that people can respect me. And um, I just appreciate her teaching and instilling all of that stuff in me because it sticks with me now, and it lets me allow me to be me and still keep it contained and not be, um, you know, just out there wow, wow in the world. I think the question of how to be a good ally to the LGBTQ community is something that a lot of non-queer artists are, are thinking about right now. And, and Haley, you just were in the Taylor Swift video for You Need to Calm Down, which featured a lot of queer performers. I know, queen of archery. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but it also directed viewers to a petition asking them to, you know, ask the Senate to pass the, the Equality Act. What about that col collaboration felt right to you? And, and to kind of open it up to all of you, what are other things that sort of non-queer artists can do to to lift up and support the community. It's interesting, like, I don't know, I've like, some. to be honest, I've always had mixed emotions with like allies and like trying to understand the relationship between it. And like, it's, I had a moment um, uh, during World Pride when I was in New York and I was on the float and I had my best friend besides me and my publicist, my everyone who works with me, and they're all very straight, like could not be more straight. <laughs> and they were like cheering and like crying and like, and they were fighting the fight for me. Like they were walking the walk and supporting pride because they loved me and they loved who I was. And so I think that allies are just as important as just anyone who's in the community because it's these are people standing up for you and fighting for you to not oh, yeah. be judged when it doesn't have anything to do with them. You know, and like that's like Huge, that's huge. Definitely. you know, and like, and then that's the whole. When you look on the other side, it's like, well, why do you have an issue with me? It has nothing to do with you, right? So, but it's like, you're supporting me, and it has nothing to do with you. Like, it's it's the most amazing support, and it's the biggest gift you could ever ask for. So, I'm very grateful for uh, Taylor's support. Um, she's been a big supporter and just like an ally, and all of the artists that are just allies of our community who are just being like, hey. They're cool. They're good people. Like, and I support you. And like, I want to, for me, it's interesting. Like, I just want opportunity. I think we all, I don't know. Like, I just wanted an opportunity to be myself. And like, I had these dreams and I wanted to play arenas and I wanted to like make art. And I just wanted the opportunity. And I felt because of what I looked like and who I was, that was just not going to happen. And I was not going to be happy, and I was forever going to feel isolated because I didn't know anyone who was gay growing up. It's important to feel like you have that opportunity, and having allies are helping support that opportunity for you. I think, so, I, think, I think the really interesting thing about the whole ally thing in the pop music world or in the music industry in general mm -hmm. is that there's a fine line because I think with Taylor, for example, what was impressive is that she did put this petition out there mm -hmm. that she yeah. is she is make she's moving people to change moving things and to take forward. action. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but I think there is criticism when an artist is just doing it for personal gain, yeah, for commercial of gain, and there are examples of, of that. Course. Mm -hmm. And there, there, it's a fine line, you know. I think. Uh, and when, you, when you're doing it real and genuinely, it comes off as that. Yes. And you know. And yeah. you know it. Yeah. You know, and a lot of times, that's where it needs to come. It needs to come from the heart. Because a lot of times, even in their family, they have gay people in their family. Yeah. So mm -hmm. if you're supporting even just your family member, 
you're supporting the community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and a lot of times they need to just look inside and and see. Because I know, like, for me, all of my people support me, all of my team. Same thing with me. My team mm -hmm. is straight as can be, but they will kick somebody butt. Mm -hmm. You know, they will... <laughs> Go out there and scream and holler. They're on stage with me. They're dancing. I mean, straight boys, girls, doing their thing. So it's just they're just as important, mm -hmm. you know, as the community as well. There, like I mean, there's said. sometimes where this, like, I don't know about you guys, but, and I have to, like, talk myself down off of it because there's this inner cynic that comes up every once in a while. You know, I try to stay positive and hopeful as much as I can, but we know we all have those little thoughts that come in mm -hmm. our head. And sometimes when this ally thing comes up, and it's like, you know, you see like a straight male pop star or an actor being like, I like gay people. And I'm like, I don't give a shit if you fucking like gay people. Yeah. Why do I need your approval? Well, I mean. And that's the, that's like well, the hard side of me. Well, that that was fake there because the yeah. way he didn't even have to say it. If, yeah. you, if, you, if somebody like you and they're real, they're going to come up to you it. automatically and, yeah. and greet you without even having to say those type of words. Yeah, it's a human. If, if yeah. you like each other as humans, that's all that needs to, yeah, I mean, no. Yeah. But that's the part of me that's a little feisty. <laughs> I like that I have it. to like yeah, it's shh, good be good, to have be good. Some feist, yeah. You know? yeah, you gotta have yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Deegan, were there times or or sort of gestures from sort of non-queer artists to to lift you and, and your band up that felt really meaningful uh, as, as you were coming up in this industry? Uh, it's okay to say no. <laughs> I'm trying to think. I know, but I don't want to say no. And then, and then yeah. someone in the comments somebody. will be like, you know, the Killers took us out on tour when, in 2004. And that was a huge tour for us. It really was when things started to change. There's definitely been bands, for sure. I don't know if they took us on tour because we were, you know, gay. But, like, I think that... Um, you know, but I, I mean, I just, I joined uh, Dan Reynolds from Imagine Dragon, started Love Lab Festival three years ago in Utah to raise money for uh, the LGBTQ community and youth specifically. Obviously, suicide rates are very high. Um, and when he reached out to me to be involved, you know, I joined the board. I've been involved for two years now. We raised a million dollars last year. We raised over a million dollars this year um, with one show. And I'm, I'm involved on the board and involved with the festival. I'm also involved with the speaker and performer side of it. It is absolutely fucking impossible to get people to come. And our allies are often just saying that they're allies, but when we ask them to actually do something, that's, it can be tough. And I, I want to disclaimer that by saying that, like, booking artists and gay artists, too, like, I mean, it's hard, you know? You got to do oh. it really far in advance. Yeah. And there's not that many of us, and so people book up fast. There's all that, but... I think it's hard. Like, I joke, and I'm I'm old and been around a long time, so I can say this. Not everyone can. But, like, sometimes it feels like unless they're getting, like, a prize or an award, they don't come. And it's hard. I want them to show up. I want them to put a petition at the end of their video. I want... Dan wraps himself in a rainbow flag every night mm -hmm. and cries, actually cries real tears, and talks about the community. And it's like... He's actually an ally, he understands the language, he sits down and has the conversation, he makes space. Love Loud had over two dozen LGBTQ artists on that stage in front of 30,000 people with millions of streams. You know, that is, he, he brought us together. None of us would be there without him because if I put together Love Loud, no one would come. You know, my band is just not important enough, it's just not big enough, and so we need our allies to do more than just say that they love us, but also... Like, so I'm like, Adam, like, there's this, there's the, 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 the part chip. of, there's the chip yeah. a bit, but I also look around and say, holy crap, people are really starting to show up. They're really starting to show up. Mm -hmm. And you I know? think that chip comes from being in the business as long as yeah, we've like been I'm in Yeah, like, I'm like a dinosaur. Like, I'm like. <laughs> you guys. I know. No, you're not. In, in music terms, I just mean, like, it's fine. I look just, young. In it's just, fine. In just saying, not necessarily like we're so old. <laughs> I, I feel that way sometimes, but more that it's we've changed seen, so much because where it was so 10 much. years ago was like a totally different from vibe. Totally. Mm -hmm. It was there was a lot more work, there was a lot more misunderstanding, there was a lot yeah. more pitfalls that yeah. came with it, I think. And I'm so happy and so thrilled to see where we are now. Mm -hmm. Cuz yeah, I cause feel like it's way easier in your own space and you're able yeah. to be comfortable in your space and do your thing, you know, without really feeling like you got somebody to tell you to do this or tell you to do mm -hmm. that or judge you or, you know, yeah. you really don't give a shit what they say yeah. because you're in your own space and you're comfortable in your lane to do whatever you want to do and create and just be a great artist. Yeah. Yeah, I think eventually we we want to just be able to be ourselves and not be judged and to not have to rely on validation from an ally to be like, hey, this person's a good person even right. though they're different. Like, we're still in that world where you have to get that 
that approval. Yeah, like a cosign. To, yeah, cosign. it's like yeah. you're co-signed. They're a safe person. <laughs> like <laughs> they're they're not gonna hurt you. And listen to their music. Should we just get them like a like something other than a rainbow? <laughs> like like a I'm sticker a good or person, something else. I swear. Yeah. <laughs> but the co- the cosign thing is it's a thing. Yeah. It is a thing. But it's important. It is important to move forward. Yeah, McCona, were there any important cosigns that made a difference for you? Lil Peep, definitely. Um, he was like new younger artists, you know, like a younger person that is like being mature about it. And it's like, oh, you know, I still love you. And like, you know, I want to work with you and stuff like that. That's cool. Actually, I've seen a lot of like drawback and withdrawal and like, you know, mm. turn the other way type of thing since coming out. But it's like, I don't know. It, it is what it is, you know? I, I, I saw the same thing. When I, when I did it, which was early on, before I even released any solo music, I, was, I did the coming out thing. And, yeah. You lost a fan. I saw, like, a lot of that. And I'm like, I don't want your kind of How fan anyway. You? Yeah. Yeah, if you're not into me who I am, you know, I, I, go away. I think that the thing that makes me so happy about the way things are, like, I think the internet obviously is a garbage can, but, <laughs> but I feel like, again, like, our community has been able to communicate and support each other in a way that just didn't exist even 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah more. Because I, 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 I'm not going to say that I didn't want allies or I didn't want our straight, like, you know, uh, contemporaries in, in, in the music business to reach out and support me. I would have actually just really loved if someone gay had. And no one did. And mm. a lot of that was because there was no way to do it. But it would have meant so much to me if some of the other really, really successful, famous queer women, which there isn't that many, obviously, but it would have meant so much. And, yeah, and, Wadden just would have came, reached out. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I, and I'm, I'm like obsessive now because I reach out to all the LGBT <laughs> yeah. girls. I'm like a psycho. It's like every time I meet a new, young, up-and-coming LGBT <laughs> girls, I like push people out of the way and I'm like, I don't even know if you don't know who my band is. My name is Tegan. I play in a band called Tegan and Sarah. And if you ever need anything, please hit me up. I will be happy to like, like be your support, help you find crew, stand up for you, like mentor you, tell you whatever. Like, because it was so lonely. It was so lonely. That's, that's how I kind of felt when Rue came for me. Yeah. I, you know, like, that that was mother rescue right there. Yeah. You know, so I understand what you're talking feels about. feels good. Yeah, it definitely feels good, especially when you have somebody in the walk of life that you're in. Yeah. To come and support you and say, hey, here's a helping hand. Yeah. Let me help you along the way. That was the best feeling. When I got the phone call from RuPaul, I was like, <laughs> oh, my God. I've been loving Rue since I was a kid. I cannot even believe this happening. So that's uh, an amazing feeling to have just that 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 support from mm-hmm. your own community. Frida, it's funny that you mentioned RuPaul because in the style of a Drag Race season finale, I was going to ask each of you, if you could go back in time, what advice would you give your younger queer teenage self about what's ahead? I would, I would tell my younger self, like, relax. It's all going to be fine. But I would just try to calm myself down. I would tell myself, like, it's okay that you're not super feminine. And it's okay that you're also masculine and that you're kind of like in the middle and um, that there are other people out there like you and um, across the globe, like everywhere. Yeah. yeah. And you, when you're younger, you, you are just, or you're just so sucked in and everything's so dramatic and you're just isolated by everyone. And so I am grateful for the internet because Without it, I wouldn't have, my fans are my community that I never had growing up. Mm -hmm. And so I would tell myself, like, you will find your people and you will find people that love you for wherever you are on the spectrum. And, like, that's okay. Yeah. I would just tell my younger self, um, be happy. uh, And kind of like I told you, (laughs) you know what I'm saying? (laughs) They stay choosing, bro. <laughs> it's, it's not just, you know what I mean? So it's like, oh, okay. Now I, now I know. It took me a long time to figure out, but it was like, why are they picking on me? Like, why are y'all bothering me so much? And it's like, oh, they probably like you. <laughs> right. Oh, that's what it is. So, you know, I'll just tell my younger self that. Like, you know, don't, don't stress it. You'll find out soon enough what it is. I'd say do not wear low-cut jeans with extremely tight shirts that just go to right here because <laughs> there's just going to be thousands and thousands of photos of you with just a tiny little bit of the muffin that's showing. Um, I, would, I, would, I, needed, I needed somebody to tell me it was as hard as it felt, you know, like building a career. And I just felt like people were always saying, I don't know if everyone else here feels, everyone's always telling you you're living your dream. Mm. But you're loving it. Mm. But it's so great. Yeah. You're having so much fun. And it's like, I am. But being told that all the time was really hard because sometimes it was just really hard. So I think I would just like to visit early 2000s us and just say, like, it is absolutely really hard. And it's okay, like, sharing a, a Connell Lodge, like, 
hotel room with your twin sister <laughs> is hard. It's absolutely hard and lonely. It's okay. That's that's part of it. That's part of being an adult. That's part of building a career. That's part of being out here. That's part of getting to do this awesome job. Is yeah. you're gonna. It's gonna be hard. You know, I was really myself being younger. I just would probably, you know, change. Um, I would have told my younger self, you don't have to eat as much because I ate a lot when I was young. And I, <laughs> But I would have I would have did a lot of stuff differently. I would have been more patient. I would have um, I would have started thinking about things that can set me up for a better future. I would say, um, just do things a little bit smarter, you know, and um, take my time with stuff and 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 pace myself and and not rush stuff. Because sometimes when you're a kid. You kind of want to do adult things and rush stuff. So just maybe just pace myself a little bit slower. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's important that we all went through the journey that we went through as a kid. That's how we're able to tell the stories that we're at now. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes us who we are. And all of those, those hiccups and all of those um, triumphs and tribulations that we went through is the, the, the basis of the story. Wonderful. Indeed. Well, thank you all so much for being here and for taking part in this conversation and being so candid. It's really wonderful to have you here as part of uh, Billboard's first Fried Roundtable. And we appreciate thank it. Thank you again. Definitely. Yay. And thanks for watching. Yes. Thank you. This was fun. Yay. Yay. Put the AC on.